could you cue up some of those pictures that I gave you of Africa? I just want to take a second and, and show you some of the pictures of Liberia, which is in West Africa. We have a ministry there, and we just started a, a crusade. We're doing 150 days this year. We just did our first five days in, in uh, Liberia, West Africa. But I just want to show how God is moving. In Liberia, gas just went up to $10 a gallon. Most people can't even drive there. Most people in Liberia don't even have electricity in their house. Only in the capital city is there real electricity. Everybody else runs on generators. Okay, the Chinese moved in and there's, they're, they're, they're gouging with not just the Chinese, but everybody in the area, the rice. Okay, it costs them a fortune to buy their food. But look at, move on to the next couple pictures. Look at the people that come out to worship God. It's amazing what God is doing in Liberia, a place that has it much harder, one of the poorest countries in the entire world in Liberia. And look how God is moving. And sometimes I think we've been a little bit spoiled in America, okay? We have, we have our, our, you know, our ideas of how life should be, and it's nothing compared to what their life. He started, they started out this uh, conference, and the vice president of TWC Ministries, that is TWC over there, by the way, TWC Ministries, um, he's greeting the people, and this is what he says. He says, I saw those that were in the funeral home today, and I didn't get your name. And everybody cheered because their name wasn't in the obituary that day. That's what life is like over there. Every day, every day they're fighting for their lives. Every single day. And they're praising God the way they're praising God. Are you ready to eat? Okay. At least the babies can make some noise. <laughs> All right, I want you to make some noise. You know, today, I really, really feel the burden today that I, you know, I want you to leave here changed. I feel the pressure, but, it's, but the anointing is going to get me through. I feel the pressure to make sure that everybody gets something today, something that you need. Everybody's going to get something that you need today. Amen? Amen? So we're preaching a message called Rise and Shine. We just finished up with serving. You know, we're believing that from now till Easter is going to be your rise up season. Okay? It's going to be your get up season. Things are going to change for you. You're going to see mighty things happening in your life. But you know what? We have to participate in those things. We have to see them on the horizon and we have to start to work towards those things. Amen? We have to be willing to get out of our comfort zones. Out of our comfort zones. There's a guy back there I'm looking at now. His name's Tony. And, you know, I see him everywhere. I see him. He works for the Washington Nationals. He, he's on television. I see him everywhere. I don't know. Last, last night he's down in Elmira doing something. But he's everywhere. But he's willing to get out of his comfort zone. And, you know, everywhere he goes, he sees God at work in his life. Because he's willing to get out and change it. Amen? Amen. Isaiah 60 and 12, uh, 1 and 2 says this. Get out of bed, Jerusalem. Wake up. Put your face in the sunlight. God's bright glory has risen for you. The whole earth is wrapped in darkness. All people sunk in deep darkness. And God is talking about the world we live in now. Okay? He knows the world we live in now. It's a rough world. It's full of darkness. But he's calling you out. He's saying, but God rises on you. His sunrise glory breaks over you. Amen? Do you believe it? It breaks over your head. If you know Jesus Christ, the light of Jesus Christ is going to shine on your head. And you're going to get a nice little suntan up there if you're starting to get a little thin up there. Okay? Otherwise, you'll get it on your shoulders. 
and on the no on your nose. But there's two things that keep us from getting everything that God has, from getting that rise and shine in our lives. Two things that I'm thinking of now. Number one, we don't let Jesus do his job in our lives. Number two, we don't do our job. Okay? So Jesus is there, always ready, always ready to do his job. He does not leave you. Okay? You either let him do his job or you don't do your part. You don't do your part. It says in Ephesians 3.20, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. You see, we forget about that little phrase sometimes that's in this verse. It says, through his mighty power at work within us. Am I too loud? Am I good? His mighty power at work within us. Don't forget that, people. His mighty power is at work within us. In John 14, it says, Christ stated that whoever believes in him will do even greater works than the ones he himself performed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's the second time you heard it, and he wants you to hear it today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His mighty works are available to you. They are available to you, but you have to let them. You have to let him. You see, we have to decide to let him in, uh, unleash his mighty power in his lives. It's the same power that caused Abraham to have a baby well beyond his childbearing years. It's the same power that took the, the walls of Jericho down. It's the same power that let the oil flow from the widow continuously. It's the same power that brought Lazarus from the dead. Okay, it's the same power that's at work within you that was at work within Jesus on the days that he walked this earth. The same power. It's available to us. Have we had a God we can explain or a God that defies explanation? That's the question. Does your God defy explanation? Or is it easy to explain him? It's available to us. Everything we need. Anybody know what that is? Cute, huh? It's been a while for some of you. Some of you never saw one. But you know what? It's the same word that came out from the platform today. Sometimes we go out from church, we go home, and we get into our lives. We have these things that come up against us. We have these burdens, but we never give them to Jesus. So what happens is we come into the church on Sunday, and we praise, and we give God glory. Oh, Jesus shows up. Look it. He shows up. He gives you everything you need. He fills you up. He encourages you. You get it. You have a good time worshiping the Lord. You move. You see God move in your life. But you know what? You say, get back in there, Jesus. It's service is over. I got to go home and watch football. I got things to do. Tomorrow's a busy day. Okay, I got to get back to work tomorrow, so get back in there, Jesus. And we don't allow him to do his job in our lives. We don't allow him. Then you have problems that come up against you. And you wonder where Jesus is. Then you come back to church on Sunday, give a little worship. Yeah, this is fun. And there he is. There he is. There's Jesus. I feel good, Jesus. I feel good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you've done for me today. And then we say, okay, Jesus. We'll see you later, Jesus. Get back in that box, Jesus. We'll see you next week. 
And you go home, and you do the same thing. Your Monday, your Tuesday, your Wednesday, your Thursday, your Friday, your Saturday is always the same. So is your Sunday. Because you come to church, you do the same thing. And you wait for Jesus, and then Jesus shows up in your life. Whoop! He shows up in your life for that hour and a half. You feel good. You know today's Groundhog Day? You ever seen that movie, Groundhog Day? We're going to do this 50 times until we get it. 50 times we're going to do the jack-in-the-box. But it's true, folks. We don't give Jesus the room to work in our lives. We keep him in a box. We keep him in a box. We let him out on Sundays. And then we stuff him back in the box. And that's one reason we never see that rise up that rise up season in our lives. Come on now, you got to have a rise up season. Do you want a rise up season? You have to allow Jesus out of the box. Amen? We have to allow Jesus out of the box. You know, I'm a roofer, and at our shop, we have about 50 huge crowbars. They weigh about 100 pounds a piece, and we use them to move big stuff. And I've thought about bringing it in to help to move some of you guys sometimes, to move you out from where, and put you where God wants you to be. Hello, Ricker. Have we limited God in our lives? And you know what? We all do it. And I decided, yes, a couple years ago, God, I'm limiting you. I've seen you move in my life. I've seen you do amazing things. You've walked with me. You've talked with me. But I'm still limiting what you want to do in my life. So we started a TWC Ministries. Wow. You know, all we did was be obedient and step out. We did nothing. We did nothing beyond that. Now we see a 1,000 pastors in Liberia. Where's my drums? We see a 1,000 people, 1,000 pastors in Liberia. We've seen the... Liberia changed. We've seen mindsets changed. Okay, we're seeing this move across the Philippines right now with pastors that just want to join a fellowship. We didn't even do anything. We just stepped out to somewhere that was unknown to us. And we decided to take ourselves and move ourselves out of that comfort zone. Amen? God's waiting for you to do that. Each one of you has these things inside of you that you want to see happen. But you know what? We just do the same thing Monday through Friday, and then we crank the box, we let Jesus out, and we go and do the same thing. Next thing you know, you're middle-aged, a little gray, wearing a football jersey, thinking you're 30 years old again. <laughs> Life moves quick. Life moves quick. You know, I wanted to use her last week for an illustration when we are talking about perception because her and I knew each other way back then, 45 years ago. We knew each other, and we did not like each other. I didn't like her. I didn't like her a bit. She liked me, but it was secret. She kept it a secret, okay? But... But we've been together for 30 years, just about. Okay? One, yeah. Yeah. One day, one day I handed a card to a business card to a friend and said, Head, have your girlfriend call me if she wants to go out on a date. And within 30 minutes, the phone was ringing. Okay? It's not a lie. And then on our third date, she asked me to marry her. <laughs> it's true. Okay, but do you think, do you think if I just was her husband on Sunday and Saturday that everything would be okay? No. No. I have to give myself to her all week long, even when I don't feel like it. Okay, I have to allow her to give herself to me all week long, even if I don't feel like it. <laughs> 
okay? That's the way it is with Jesus. Jesus wants to be in your life all week. He wants you to be able to rise up to everything that he's called you to do, but he has to be there full time. It can't be part time. I want to set up a, a story out of 2 Kings 3. Okay? There was three countries, or three cities, people. There was Israel, there was Edom, and there was Judah. Okay? Judah, there was uh, King Jehoshaphat. Who names their kid Jehoshaphat? Imagine that. Jehoshaphat Redner. <laughs> Je King Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat loved God. Okay? And then, y'all ever hear of uh, Jezebel and Ahab? Okay? Jeze Jezebel and Ahab, they had a, they had a son named Jeroham. Jeroram or something like that. And he was the king over Israel. And then there was a king over Edom who they didn't serve the Lord, but they were friends with the other two. And the, the, uh, Je Jezebel's son there, he, uh, he felt this country Moab coming against him. He felt a lot of pressure. And he, and he went to Jehoshaphat, and he went to the king of Edom, and he said, can you march with me so that we can go take Moab? And Jehoshaphat said, you know what, you are my brother. You're not serving the Lord because he wasn't serving the Lord. Ahab and Jezebel were the worst kings and queens of that time, ever. Okay? He got rid of some of those things, but he still wasn't serving the Lord, and neither were his people. But Jehoshaphat said, because you're my brother, we'll go with you. So, so they start to go through the desert. They're marching over to Moab. They're going to the desert, and they get caught there. They've been on the road for seven days. They're in the desert. It's hot. The next thing they know, they run out of water. Their horses have no water. Well, I could use some water. Their horses have no water. And um, so, th so they start to complain. They say, excuse me. So they say this, why did the Lord bring us to the desert to leave us here to die? Why? Why? And they said, well, let's bring a prophet. Let's hear what the prophet has to say. So they call on and they say, well, we have a prophet here. His name is Elisha. And he used to, he used to serve Elijah, who was one of the greatest prophets. Let's call Elisha and see what Elisha has to say. Elisha came to him and he said, listen, why don't you call the prophets of your dad? He's, he said this to Jezebel's son. Why don't you call the prophets of your parents? Because I'm not going to want to help you. But then he looked at Jehoshaphat and he said, because Jehoshaphat is here, I will help you. Now I'm telling you something. When you serve the Lord, other people around you will get blessed. They will get blessed. Let me tell you something else. All those people out in the workplace that you know, all of those people that, aren't, that don't know Jesus, they have family members that are praying for those people. You know what? They've been praying for you to step in front of their unsaved children for a long time. They've been praying for you. And because you're serving the Lord, they should be blessed. Don't ever get discouraged. Those that are around you will be blessed, even if they don't know the Lord. But the key is, they need to come to know the Lord. Amen? Make some noise. Amen. So Elisha, Elisha says, okay, I'm ready, I'll help you. He says, bring me a musician. So they're stuck, they're hungry. They probably act like a bunch of Americans at that point in time. What? We need, all, we need food, we need water, and you're calling for a musician? What's your problem, Jack? What are you doing? Why are you calling for a musician? You see, the enemy brought them to the desert, and he wants to keep them dry. He wants to keep them dry. And worship is something that changes 
how we feel. We look at God different. We look at our, situ our situations differently. Okay, that's why Elisha said, you know what? I've got a word from the Lord, but i got to hear some worship first. I want to worship God first. So he calls for a musician. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle work, promise keep a light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. worship. He got worship. Okay? His, his mind was changed. He was caught in the desert, but his mind was changed. And you know, some of you guys today, you're caught in the desert. There's people in this room, they're caught in the desert. They're caught up on this or they're caught up on that, but you're caught up on something. And what happened is you start being fear leaders in your life instead of cheerleaders. Okay? You, you don't believe that God will do it. You don't believe that he'll do it. It's too hard. I can't make it. It didn't work before, so it's not going to work this time. But we need to flip the script, and we need to start being cheerleaders in our lives. Cheerleaders, I say. He did it before. He'll do it again. How many times did God do something for you? He did it before. He'll do it again. He healed me before. He'll heal me again. You know what? The door might look closed. But I see it's open, okay? The enemy wants me to see a closed door, but God says it's open. It's open. It's an open door. Worship changed him. I may feel small, but he's called me to be big. You might feel small. He's called you to be big. He's called you to be big. Hallelujah. Elisha needed a word from heaven, so he called on the worshiper. He called on a worshiper. He seals off those distractions. Then it happened. When he was worshiping, he got a word from God. He got a word from God. And he said, you know what? Make this valley full of ditches. Remember, they were stuck in a desert in a valley. And God said, you know what? Take out your shovels. Take out your stones. Take out your sticks. And dig me some ditches. What? Dig me some ditches, Lord? Dig some ditches? Really? We're stuck here. We're hungry. We're thirsty. And you want us to dig some ditches? You know what? That's God saying, I'm going to move, but you have to move first. Okay? I'm going to do this for you, but you have to do something to get there. Okay? Some of you all need to become ditch diggers. You know? We got to get the shovel out, folks. Remember, the second thing is when we allow God to work in our lives, the thing that can keep us back from our rise inside shine season is the fact that we don't want to dig any ditches. We don't want to dig any ditches. God is saying, dig and get ready. Dig and get ready. Can you dig? If you want something uncommon to happen in your life, do something uncommon for God. Okay? If you want something amazing to happen in your life, then do something amazing for God. And this is how you do it, folks. You got to dig. You got to get the shovel out and you got to dig. You got to believe that God is with you. Keep him out of the box. But you got to dig the ditches. You got to get in the trenches and you got to dig them. Many people want to be blessed and favored. but they want to pretend they work for the state. 
<laughs> Pastor David has retired from this game. Okay, they want to stand on their shovel. They want prosperity in their lives, but they don't want to dig. They want blessings to come in their lives, but they don't want to dig. They want to lean on their shovel. I'll dig it myself. Jesus, take the wheel. I'm going to dig. I'm going to dig, young man. I'm going to dig so your life is better. Okay? I'm going to dig so you have some hope in your life. All right? I'm going to let you see me digging. You want to know why? Because I want you to be a digger too. All right? I'm going to set an example for you. I'm going to dig. I'm going to dig ditches. I don't know, maybe dig ditches. <laughs> I'm digging a ditch with my money. I'm digging a ditch with my giving. Okay? I'm digging a ditch with my words. All right? I'm digging a ditch with everything I got. I'm digging a ditch with my worship. Okay? I'm digging a ditch and I'm putting God first. Everything I do, I'm digging a ditch for Jesus. I'm going to be the example that people need to see. I'm going to dig some ditches. I don't care if i got to be out there by myself, but I'm going to dig some ditches. But God is calling you to rise up and dig some ditches. This man right here has been serving the Lord for a long time. Where are you coming from every week? Where do you live? Addison. Okay. They get up every Sunday, and they get ready for God. Okay. And they go out and they live it. They're home digging some ditches. I don't care if you're in a wheelchair. I don't care what your circumstance is. You can dig some ditches, baby. You can dig some ditches. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. You need help digging? I'm here. I got a shovel. I'll help you dig. Okay, that's why I'm here. I'm here to help you dig. You might be crying. I don't know what you got in your life, but God's saying, you know what, if you dig that ditch, I'm going to help that thing in your life. Okay, you might be crying while you're digging, but you're digging. People may not understand why you're digging, but you're digging. When everybody else is quitting, you're going to keep digging. Nobody in this world wants to dig, but you're going to dig some. You're going to dig. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads with me for a second. I want to share with you. It says in verse 18 of 2 Kings 3 this, And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. When they woke in the morning, the sun was shimmering off of the water that had filled those ditches. You see, God filled that valley full of water. He filled those ditches that those people dug, and he gave them water. And it says that the light was shimmering off of the water. And that's your rise up season, folks. That's your rise and shine. You got your heads bowed. I'm supposed to be doing altar, and I'm still screaming. I'm sorry. It's okay. You can look at me. God says, I will fill your valley full of water if you'll dig the ditches. Okay? The sunlight will shimmer off of the water. The sunlight shimmering off the water will cause your enemies to flee. And I will shine on your face. I will shine down on you.
shovel. <laughs> yeah, paraphrase in there. And a shovel in the air. I will be planted firmly on love. You'll be able to take in all of the followers of Jesus, the extravagant dimension of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breath. Test its length. Plumb the deck depths and rise to the heights. Live full life, full in the fullness of God. Now, if there's anybody in this room that needs a little prayer and a little help and they want to come up to this altar, we're gonna we're gonna shovel some, we're gonna dig some ditches with you if you need to. But we're gonna finish this song now. take them home. We're going to take them to work. We're going to keep God up here where he belongs. We're going to keep Jesus right there. And when we do, the sun, sun will rise on you. And this will be your rise up Here 